the Metropolitan Council. It is Wednesday, March 13th, 2019, and we call the meeting to order. First order of business is approval of the agenda. Can I have a motion and a second? Moved. Second. second. It's been moved and seconded approval of the agenda. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. The motion to approve the agenda is adopted. Approval of minutes. Next order of business is approval of the minutes from our March 6th special meeting. Can I have a motion and a second to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. second. Okay. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. The motion to approve the minutes from March 6th is approved. Next, we have a public invitation. Uh, at this point in the meeting, members of the public who wish to address the council on matters not on the agenda may do so. Oh, please limit your comments to three minutes. So I understand that there is one person that wanted to address the council. Are they here? Okay. Okay, so, so we have a sign up sheet, so she just wanted to make sure. The thing about if you sign up, you actually, no, there is nobody. Okay, so there's nobody here. So we will move on from the public invitation now to business, which includes the first item will be the consent agenda item. Uh, or, okay, there is, oh, they didn't want to speak. Okay, just so somebody signed up but not speaking. Uh, consent agenda items uh, will be enacted in one motion with no separate discussion. If a discussion of an item is desired, the item will be removed. So if you need to do that, let me know. Um, can I have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion is carried to approve the consent agenda. So that now brings us down to the report of standing committees. Uh, we will hear from the standing committees first. Uh, transportation is the only committee with a report of this at this time because we're kind of revving up the new committees, right? Uh, Council Member Barb. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, Council Members, business item number 2019-54, same week, is regarding the amendment to, of the 2019 through 2022 Transportation Improvement Program, or TIP, to change the scope of MnDOT's I-35 West Pavement Rehabilitation Project. We did have some information provided to our Transportation Committee the other day about TIP amendments, uh, but we've got uh, Director Thompson from MTS here to provide some background for the room. Everyone else. Madam Chair, Council Members, uh, the um, action tonight is fairly routine. It's one you're going to see about 20 times a year on average. We have about 20 TIP amendments, but I thought I'd just lay the groundwork for what these are so you have some context about this particular amendment for I-35W. So the Transportation Improvement Program is the program of what, what this region is going to build on transportation in the next four years. Each year, you as the council approve the TIP. Um, but, and that's usually, uh, we have a public comment period with a fall approval, and it's a four year look ahead. So every year we update for the next four years. Um, our TIP in our region must include any project that has federal funds on it. Um, we also have any significant projects, they usually have federal funds, but MnDOT also chooses to place all of their projects within the TIP, no matter the funding source. So two to 300 projects are in the TIP on, on average. Is a requirement that the MPO approve the TIP and then submit it to MnDOT and they get added to the statewide TIP each year. Um, but it's, it's our authority to approve this and the projects that are within that. Um, the TIP is a good, not only it lists individual projects, but it gives a good summary of what this region will be constructing on all modes on our regional network each year. The TIP that we are currently in covers from July 2018 through uh, June 2030, and that's the amendment we're gonna make an amendment within that four year block. But approximately $4 billion of transportation investment projects are within that TIP that we're amending tonight. And you can see the breakdown of which, how they break down around federal funding, federal transit funding, a lot of the, like the transit way, federal funds for transit ways, blue line extension, for example, will come, or green line extension, will be reflected in this tip and trunk highway funds. It's the tip is the what we're responsible also for for the MPO region. So it's all the projects within the seven counties, but it's also the urbanized area. And just a reminder that our urbanized area for the Twin Cities extends to Sherburn and Wright County portions of that. So if there's any project that is within 
that urbanized area outside the seven counties, that would be reflected in this tip too. And we, we do have projects that are on, for instance, Highway I-94 or um, 169 or some example projects in Oak River or Monticello or St. Michael that might appear in this tip, but they're outside the seven county region. So who programs the projects? It's TAB, all, this amendments all go through TAB and the TIP goes through TAB and then comes to the Transportation Committee. This item was at Transportation Committee last Monday or this Monday and then approved here. Um, we include each, uh, when we have a regional solicitation, all those projects which were approved in January get added to this year's TIP as a block of projects because they'll be built within the four years. MnDOT submits us a list of projects that they anticipate over the four years. And then we do have some county-led projects and occasionally a city project that would be reflected that is uh, has some special federal funds outside of regional solicitation. So the council approves that overall tip and then individual changes uh, for items that are already in the tip. And those are called tip amendments. Um, we do have projects change. You get funding for a project, you enter the tip and maybe the project is four years from being constructed. There's a lot of work that goes on in those four years. We can learn more about what the project will cost. You may encounter something in, in the place you're building that requires a change in the project. Uh, may split off parts of the scope of the project and put it on another project. And so any certain types of changes in a project require that they come back and seek approval for those changes. Uh, and then that becomes a tip amendment. Uh, sometimes or a TAB or the council, if it's a project that was funded through regional solicitation, will maybe not approve that um, change because it really changes, reflects the change of the project. But often they are uh, unanimously approved by TAB and supported by the council. There are some minor changes that do not require amendments. If a project was supposed to be built in 2020 and we decide to build it, it the sponsor builds it in 2021, those are things that wouldn't come back here or the local funding maybe increases, but the federal funding funding does not change. Um, and just some minor changes like that don't require amendments. So we have the cr criteria we have for amendment approvals is number one, <coughs> their funding to build, um, create this amendment. Our, our tip has to be fiscally balanced. Projects reflected in there must be matched with funding that is available to build them. It must be consistent with our policy plan, so we check to make sure that any change in the project. Originally, that project was in the TIP and it was consistent, but maybe a change makes it inconsistent with some policy plan initiative. Um, we do an air quality check to make sure that we remain in conformance with Clean Air Act, and that is done through coordination with the other, with partners. And then all TIP amendments have a public input process, and so you might receive public input that would inform you as you're making a decision about an amendment. So today's tip amendment sponsor is MnDOT. It's I, on I-35W between Portland Avenue and Washington Avenue, a uh, rehab project. MnDOT has now got to the point where they want to do this project this year, and as they're designing it, they changed how uh, the length, extent of the project. Um, and what really triggered the change is that one part of the scope of the project they removed, and that is at one of the signals at Washington Avenue and 35W, they plan to put some accessible signal uh, buttons on the signals, and they determined that the, the signals there were too old, they couldn't accommodate them. So through an agreement, they've decided to build those in a future project one or two years out when they replace the entire signal. Um, the project cost remains the same, and so that's just an example of a minor change that does trigger to amendment. Oops. We uh, received no public comment. Uh, the, at TAB and ATTAC, there was some questions about this ADA change. But everybody was confident that because MnDOT is committed to still making that signal accessible on a future project, that they were comfortable with that. And so with that, uh, the request is that this uh, tip amendment be approved by the council. Thank you. Councilmember Barber. Uh, therefore, Madam Chair, I move that the Metropolitan Council concur with the Transportation Advisory Board action to amend the 2019 through 2022 Transportation Improvement Program to change the scope of MnDOT's I-35W pavement rehabilitation project. There is a motion. Is there a second? I'll second that. There's a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Okay. Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion is carried for item number, I'm just trying to find it on here, 
okay, 2019-54. There we go. Thanks. Other business, uh, that brings us to our other business members. We have an informational presentation from the Deputy Regional Administrator and CFO on an overview of the Met Council's budget. At this time, I would ask Mary Bogey to come and give her presentation. So uh, I will let you know this is the bulk of the meeting today. It should go, she's promising less than an hour, we're hoping. <laughs> but we know it's very, and then we can, um, but we'll take a time check and I think she does want to take some questions as we go along or she'll let you know that the time's for that. Welcome to the Met Council. I uh, have you proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I will say that there's a natural breaking point in this presentation between the operating budget and the capital program. So I'll ask at that time, have you had enough? Um, I've been told that budget presentations can get a little dense. Um, <laughs> we'll try to make the, it a little bit more uh, fun to go through. I apologize to Council Member Barber and Council Member Wolf who have already heard the budget and it's already been adopted. Um, but uh, one more time is a good refresher. So. So with that, um, let's get started. Uh, I will also say that Anna is setting up some shorter um, meetings that you can sign up to it, that will take a little bit deeper dive into the budget if you have some questions. That's totally voluntary. Um, but if, you, if you're going through the budget and you say, hey, I wanna learn more about the council's levy and, and how we levy, um, we'll do a deeper dive into those things in some of those, those sessions that you can come and sign up for. So, Like many of the local governments, the council adopts its budget on a calendar year. Um, we adopt both an operating budget that includes our operations, our pass-through programs, those are really grant programs or our housing program where we get money in and we pass it straight on through to someone else, um, debt service, and our other post-employment benefits. The council has fully funded its retiree health care benefit. Um, and we have funds invested at the State Board of Investment that we draw upon to pay the annual expenses related to a retiree health care. Our capital program includes authorized projects. Those are projects that have secured their funding and they are, the project work has begun. Uh, we also have a six-year plan for future projects or phases of projects and then we have an annual spending plan. So this next slide talks about our budget development schedule and I'll tell you that I feel like we are in a perpetual state of, of budget preparation because we do an annual budget. So during, starting kind of in this March through July time, the staff and the committee start talking about their budget for the upcoming year. Uh, we have a statutory deadline to adopt our operating budget and our tax levy by September 1st of each year. Why do you think that might be? Our levy is included with all of the counties and the truth and taxation statements that go out. And so by September, we have to have that done by September 1. And after that time, the council can modify its budget and it can change its levy, but it can't raise its levy. So it can go down, but it can't go up. Um, the budget that we present to you in the, in the preliminary budget is the recommended regional administrator's budget. It's not the end of the process, it's kind of the beginning of the process. You'll hear it in committee, you'll hear kind of the whole cloth budget when we get to the preliminary budget and then there's opportunity for that to change. In October, we present our capital program to the council. The capital program is really a living document. So we don't start with a clean slate each year during the year, we amend projects into the capital program, into the authorized capital program when their funding is secured. So when we get a full funding grant agreement, we can amend it into the authorized capital program, out of the planned and into the authorized state appropriations. Again, we move projects from planned into authorized. Um, and then we also remove projects as they're completed by amendment out of the program. Um, each year during budget development, we also extend out to that next year. So six year capital plan, we drop off one year on one end and we add one year on the other end. Also in October, the council adopts a public comment draft budget. That's our unified budget, both our operating and capital program. And we're out for public comment until we finally adopt the budget on December 12th. We take public comment in many forms um, during the, the time period when we are um, adopting the budget in December, we invite the public to come here if they wish to question the council, 
We do it through email. We do it through social media. Um, we have a live person who answers the phone here when somebody calls. Um, the most comment that we get comes through that live call. Generally, they're asking about their county taxes or their city taxes or just who is the Met Council. Um, again, they've got a live person on the phone, so um, when they're calling the other numbers, they generally get a recorded message, but we have a live person that answers that phone. Just wanted to make a few comments about the council's financial position. Uh, we have an excellent <coughs> operating fund balance position. We have council policy that sets target reserves for all of our operating funds. All of our funds are at or above those targets. Um, in the management committee, we review those operating results every quarter and talk about where we are in terms of, of where we think we're going to end up by the end of the year. Um, historically, we have managed our levies below our caps. Our, we are limited in uh, the amount that we can levy by a cost of inflation called the implicit price deflator that's in statute that limits the amount we can go up each year. Um, we have a very prudent debt management program. We are a triple A rated um, organization, both by Moody's and by Standard & Poor's. Um, why does that matter? because it gives us the lowest bargaining or borrowing that's available in the market. So who has a mortgage out there? So I have one too. Um, think about your mortgage and the rate that you're paying on your mortgage. Last year I issued 105 million in wastewater debt over 20 years, 3.2% is the rate that the council got. Um, transit debt, I issued 38 million over 10 years, 2.5%. Uh, we have a PFA loan that's public finance authority um, for our wastewater, 45 million, 20 years. They give us a basis point break, 1.09%. So why does a AAA matter? Because there's real dollars that we're talking about here. Um, when we um, go out to market with our debt, we use a financial advisor, obviously, when we do that but we handle the phone call with the rating agencies ourselves. So myself, um, Director of Finance for Metro Transit, Director of Finance for Environmental Services, a number of my budget and finance staff, we sit down in a room and we have a conversation with the rating agencies. We talk about um, things like ridership, we talk about what's happening in the legislative session, we talk about what's happening with wastewater and with home sales because or, or development because that impacts our SAC. Um, so we talk about all of those things um, with the rating agencies, and here's what Standard & Poor's says about us when they write about us and do our rating. They say we have a very large tax base covering a diverse economy of the Twin Cities. Great. We, we, we live where we live, and that's a good thing. Um, they say we have substantial liquidity, low debt to pension burden. But they also say that we have well-managed financial operations with a history of positive results and operating flexibility. That's important. That comes from that meeting and that conversation with them. Um, I talked about um, fully funded other post-employment benefits. Um, those benefits have been set sunset with all of our bargaining units, so there's no new entries into that program. And we do have some current employees that have that benefit. They still have to meet their service and age requirements to become eligible for that. We do an actuarial valuation every two years. Um, we're up for one um, in January of 19. We'll, we'll, have, we'll do one as of that date. Um, the last one was in January one, as of January 1, 2017. Our liability was $271 million. Um, we have assets with the State Board of Investment greater than $200 million. Um, 60% equities, 40% fixed income. We want to stay fully funded. We draw about 14 million from that fund annually to pay retiree premiums, and we're earning about 19 million a year. So we're still growing that fund, and we expect over time that it's going to grow to, to meet all of the needs for the participants in that program. We also self-fund our employee health benefits. Um, we've been doing that since about 2012. Uh, we were seeing double digit increases in our premiums um, under a fully funded plan and by 
going to a self-funded plan, it gave us greater control over setting those premiums. And it also meant that we held the, our reserves here. So we took on some risk, but we built the reserve then to manage that risk. Um, prior, the, when you're fully funded, the, in, the insurance company holds that reserve and they decide how big or small it needs to be. And so um, really good savings there. We were able to hold our rates flat for the first three years and we've got very manageable increases as we've moved forward on that. For 2019, um, the anticipated costs for premiums are about 82 million. The employer pays most of that, the employee pays a share of that as well. Um, the last bullet point there says that we um, identify our risks and we really proactively manage those. And just a couple examples of how we do that. So we are very heavily dependent on motor vehicle sales tax. As you know, when the economy dips, what do people do? They put off those purchases of, of big ticket items. And so one of our ways of managing kind of that volatility that we see in the motor vehicle sales tax is we budget 95% of the November forecast and anything we received in the prior year that's above that 95%. So it's giving us some time when we have volatility in that forecast to deal with that. We also hedge our fuel um, consumption. So we use about 9 million gallons of fuel and we hedge for budget certainty. So we buy out 24 months in advance and then we just roll those contracts every month on and off. So we're not speculating the market, we're just gaining budget certainty. 90% of our projected fuel, we hedge out 24 months into the future. And then in wastewater, we base our, our allocation of our needs in wastewater on last year's flow. So we're not trying to predict, predict are we gonna have a rainy uh, event in this current year? We're, we're basing our costs on last year's flow. And so that gave both predictability to our budget, but also to our ratepayers. And so those are some of the ways that we use to manage risk in our budget. I like to start out um, talking about the budget and talk about our property tax levy because it's probably the most controversial area that the council has because we levy a, a, a tax, but we're an unelected council. So we hear that over and over. But as we talk about our levy, um, much of what we levy passes on through to, to others as well. So primarily, and as highlighted in the blue there, the, the largest portion of our levy, and it's significant, $87 million is a pretty significant levy, but the largest portion of that is for debt service. So transit debt service and our parks debt service, uh, that's for our capital program, the needs of our capital program. Um, Come, are paid for by our property tax levy. Our wastewater program debt is paid for from wastewater and SAC fees. Um, we levy across the seven county metro region, except for the transit, the debt, transit debt, and that's over the transit taxing communities. And I have a little bit of a slide to show you where that is. Our non-debt service levies, that's the livable communities and the general purpose, um, those are the ones that are capped by the implicit price depleter. Our debt service levies are not capped. We can levy as much as we need to pay debt service, but we are capped in our bonding authority. So, so in effect, they are capped. Um, the next slide shows our outstanding debt as of the end of the year 2018. We have 1.5 billion in outstanding debt. As you can see by the slide, wastewater is predominantly um, the, the largest part of that. Again, it's paid by wastewater fees and SAC fees, um, transit and parks. Um, we use our regional authority for transit and parks as matched to other <coughs> funding sources. So primarily we use our bonding and transit for our fleet replacement and we will match 80% federal funding with 20% of our regional bonding for that fleet replacement. Same goes, same for parks. <coughs> we'll match two to three of other funding sources. For wastewater, our regional bonding is the primary. Um, there aren't other funding sources for that program. We do do a little bit of pay as you go um, and that helps us manage our, our wastewater rates. Um, so we pay some cash for our capital program as well, but primarily for our wastewater, the bonding is, is their primary source of funding. This next slide shows our current authority for parks, 
we have 40,000 or 40 million at any time can be outstanding. So it's revolving authority. For transit, we have to go back to the legislature each year or, or every other year and ask for that authority. Oftentimes that gets caught up in what's happening up at the legislature. And so the reason that we see um, 138 million there in current authority is that we have a couple years worth of authority there because it got held up in the past. Um, the, for wastewater, we have unlimited authority to, to issue what we need to support our capital program. Um, the middle of that chart there shows my planned issuance in 2019. Um, for parks, we don't have a need to issue. I have still proceeds in hand. Um, for transit, um, because we have a couple years, usually I issue about 45 million for the transit capital program. I'm issuing 72 million. That goes out over 10 years. And then when we issue in the capital program, we issue for the cash flow needs of all of the projects in the capital program generally not for a specific project. However, we do have for transit this year, we're building the Minneapolis bus garage. And so we're going to do a separate issue at the same time for the bus garage. And we're gonna put that out over 20 years because the life of a building is obviously longer than the life of, of our fleet. And so we try to match our, our bond period over the life of the assets that we're bonding for. Um, this is just a little bit of an example to talk about um, when we need our bonding authority versus when I issue bonds. So we don't allow somebody to place an order until they have authority. So I need my authority up at the time where I want to place an order. So, so this is just an example of a bus purchase. So in year one, I get my bonding authority from the legislature. I come to the council and I do an amendment to the capital program. I move it from planned to authorized, and then I can place my order. It's gonna take about 18 months for them to build those buses for us. So I time my bond issuance late in year two or even early in year three, so that as I'm taking delivery and need to pay for those buses, that's when I'm issuing the bonds. So I have bonding authority that that is not issued yet, and we often get questioned about why do you have so much authority? This, this is the answer because I don't issue the bonds until I have to pay for the item, but I need the authority before I'll allow them to order the item. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, this next slide shows the percentage of our levy, uh, the metro area tax dollar. And as you can see, we are, are a small player in that metro area tax dollar. Yes, we have a significant levy at $87 million, um, but counties, cities and towns, school districts are the primary taxers on the metro area. And our 1.6 used to be two, we're actually becoming a smaller portion of that tax dollar. Um, this next slide shows our taxpayer impact. And so I take this hypothetical $250,000 home sitting out there in the metro area and taking that, that hypothetical home and looking at our, our taxing area. If, there, if someone lives within the transit tax communities and that's the green area of the metro chart there, they pay about $55. And someone who lives outside of the transit taxing area pays about $18 for the council's levy. So um, we have a levy strategy that we've been working through with the prior council. And as we develop this year's budget, I will be uh, looking to Nora and to, and to you to help us set your levy strategy for as we move forward under this council. Um, we have a couple of levy givens. So we need to meet our transit and parks debt service needs, obviously, so that's kind of a given. Um, we get $5 million through statute of fiscal disparities. Again, that's a given that it can be spent for tax-based revitalization. Um, and then we have strategy decisions. And the previous council was very comfortable with a 2% annual increase in our levy. Um, so that's, again, something that we'll talk about as we start moving into, into this budget cycle. Um, they chose to have us maximize the livable communities levy up to the limit. 
um, they wanted to, within that program, create a $5 million transit-oriented development component without impacting the, the, the local communities program. So I'm um, trying to keep one the same and build the next. They also chose to maximize the general purpose levy. The general purpose levy is our most, most flexible dollars. Uh, we have no levy for the highway right of way program. We have sufficient reserves for that program, about $16 million sitting waiting for somebody to come and say we need to use that for its specific purpose. Mary, could you um, explain uh, fiscal disparities? Um, Madam Chair and committee members, I could not do that in the time that we have today, but okay. if you want us to come do a presentation on fiscal disparities, we certainly can do that. Just a brief, like, Top level. <laughs> Couple and sentences. chair and council members, it's a way of redistributing within the metro area. Yeah. So. so, and I know the people who have been on city councils and in government know about this, but I think at some point we might want that. I think fiscal disparities is really an important policy. And so, uh, another time, how's that? Okay. Thank you. That works. Thank you, Madam Chair. We do have some pressures on the levy strategy. Um, so um, in terms of the general purpose levy and the livable community demonstration account levies, again, those are capped by that general inflation indicator called the implicit price deflator. That goes up kind of on average 2%. Sometimes it's a little lower, sometimes it's a little higher. Um, our annual transit bonding authority that's been growing at about 4.5%. Remember, I have to go back to the legislature each year to get that, but we've been successful in getting some inflationary factor built into that as well. So that puts pressure when I look at those two things together, that's about a 3% annual growth. Um, so that puts pressure on the strategy of holding our levy of, at 2% annual growth. But because we don't have pressures from the tax base revitalization, just a 5 million off the top, or the highway wider value program, we haven't needed to levy for that. And currently parks debt service isn't putting any pressure on the levy. So we've been able to manage within that 2% levy growth. Um, I think we can do that for some time into the future, but there's we're gonna come to a time where where 2% isn't going to cut it if our transportation levy continues to grow. So unless there's another funding source and then we're not relying so much on, on that, that um, levy for our capital program, it's going to put pressure on, on the overall 2% level levy for the council. So as I said, our general purpose levy, that's about $15.3 million. Um, that is our most flexible money the council has here at here. We can spend that on anything that falls within our statutory authority in law. So if I can spend it on transit, I can spend it on parks, I can spend it on waste order, I can spend it anywhere where the council has authority. Um, by limitation, again, it's capped by the implicit price <coughs> deflator. We have primarily used that to fund community development administration. They have no other funding source, so, so we need to spend it there. Um, by statute, we need to transfer a million dollars into the local housing incentive account. And we used to fund a portion of the regional administration budget with the general purpose levy. It wouldn't cover it all of it, but it would cover a portion. Um, several years ago, the council decided to fully allocate out regional administration costs to the rest of the operating division. Remember, regional administration are the central service functions for the rest of the division, so HR, payroll, finance, <coughs> um, IT. We fully allocate those out to the divisions. That gave some flexibility in the general purpose levy to target at some initiatives. Um, we use those targeted initiatives as one-time funding or as bridges to other funding. Um, again, because there's pressure on the levy and we don't know how long we could continue to, to provide this, this space to do this. So in the 2019 budget, um, we targeted ADA compliance. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit later about the HRA and some challenges we have there. So we targeted preserving our housing vouchers in, a, in the HRA. Um, in environmental services, we have some stormwater management grants. It's kind of a pilot program. These things work for that. We'll need to find another funding source. Um, and then we're doing just some, some plaza repairs and some, the, the CRM project is a technology type project for um, community relations tracking. 
So again, our most flexible money here we have here at the council. Our livable communities levies, these are grant programs. We grant out 100% of the dollars. We don't carry an administration fee of that. We handle that within our general purpose levy. So everything that comes in through the tax levy for livable communities gets passed out to, to the communities. So tax based revitalization account, that's clean up of polluted <coughs> land in the metropolitan area. And again, we get 5 million annually from the fiscal disparities pool. Livable de communities demonstration account levy, um, development and redevelopment of housing that links jobs, effective use of land and infrastructure. Um, again, our strategy has been to grow that levy to accommodate a TOD program of about $5 million. Um, and again, it's also capped by the explicit price deflator. And then the local housing incentives account, um, producing and preserving housing choices that are affordable to low to moderate incomes. Um, we have statutory transfers both within the LCDA account as well as from the general purpose levy that, on that account. So any questions on bonding levies? Let's move on. Maybe, there we go. So this is a look at our operating budget for 2019. Um, uses by category and function. On the left side there you see our, uh, the dark blue is the operations, um, the green debt service, um, the red are pass-through programs, again, primarily um, grant programs. If you have your budget book and you looked at page 19 of the budget book, you would see that our pass-through programs are our HRA. So we're passing through federal funding out to landlords. Um, parks, we pass some state funding for operations and maintenance. Again, directly through the council out to the parks implementing agencies, our little boat communities grant programs. Um, the suburban transit providers get a portion of a motor vehicle sales tax that's also passed through. And then in environmental services, we have some grant programs for our inflow and infiltration grants where we've got some state funding and stormwater grants that we pass through to local partners. On the right side of that pie chart, I just broke out for you the operations component so that you can see the portion of that that is um, salaries and benefits. Over 60% of that operations slice is paying for the people here that are putting service on the street and, and manning our wastewater systems. This next slide breaks down that operating budget by division. So uses by division and then also FTEs by division. So um, again, transportation, environmental services, community development, um, regional administration and OPEB, that small slice on top. Again, regional administration represents those central service functions for the organization. The costs related to that are about 70 million in this budget, but they are allocated out and they show up in the operating division budgets. So the only thing that's showing on this slide here are that, that $4 million in general purpose levy that we're targeting for initiatives and then the, the use of OPEB. On the right side of the chart there shows our um, FTEs. If you went to the budget book at, on page H, or appendix H1, that has a further breakout of, of all of those FTEs. Um, in transportation, about 2,000 of those 3,525 FTEs are operators and maintenance related to putting our bus service on the street. Next slide shows where our sources of funding come from for our, for our operating budget. So um, important that I note that our funding sources have statutory restrictions. So I can't take wastewater fees to solve a transit problem. I can't take <laughs> federal funds meant for the HRA to solve a parks issue. There are very strict um, statutory restrictions requirements on each of those funding sources and what they fund. So um, starting at the top there, our property tax levy, we talked about that already, um, $87 million. Most of that is our pass-through program for livable communities as well as our debt service. Only about 2% of the funds there actually fund that blue slice from the previous slide that was operations. Um, and that's that general purpose portion of that piece. 
Um, on the dark blue on this slide, you'll see that we have charges for service. About a third of our revenues come, a little over a third of our revenues come for charges for service. So that's wastewater fees and fares that we charge the customer. Um, the green large slice there is broken down into our motor vehicle sales tax and our state appropriations, primarily funding transit. Motor vehicle sales tax obviously is all, all transit, the state appropriation, primarily transit, but also in there are our parks, operations and maintenance, about $9 million there, and our I&I &I grant funding, inflow and infiltration grants. Our federal funds are primarily housing, so the federal government pass those through to landlords, um, but also um, transportation for, we have a little bit of a, a preventative maintenance program coming from the feds as well. And then the local there in the lighter blue, that's primarily our funding partners for the, the um, light rail lines and they're paying their 50% share of the operations of those lines. The next few slides, I just want to highlight some of our funding sources and some of the challenges that the council is facing that you will hear about more in the committees, um, both as we build the new budget as well as just to give you some grounding in, in the challenges that we are facing. So I want to talk about, start off by talking about um, our federal funds. Again, we have federal funds that, that are used in our HRA that pass through to landlords for that program. The slide shows you the area in yellow and the chart on the side where our HRA serves. Um, we serve about 6,500 families. The average household size is 2.9 members. Average income, $16,000. 45% of them have wage income. 47% um, of them are elderly or disabled. 53% um, are families with children. The average payment from our participants in the program for their rent is $390. The average rent payment from HRA is $740. So I mentioned that we're using a portion of our general purpose levy to preserve housing vouchers. And this slide kind of shows you what's been happening in the, in the HRA program and, and one of the challenges that we're faced with. So federal funding that comes to us for the housing program is based on the previous year's expenditures and, and a percentage of our voucher utilization. So the more vouchers we utilize, the more funding that we get and then based on our prior year. When you're in a situation where the rents in the market are going up, so my rent payments are going up, but my funding is based on last year's funding, I have a mismatch between the funding that's being reimbursed to me, that little part on the right, $730, and the funding that the budget needs. And so for each, so I've, I've got a structural deficit on for each of them, and over the course of the, the year, that's about $1.3 million underfunding or structural deficit in the housing uh, payments that we need for for manning our, our, our continuing to preserve our vultures. So the problem with trying to deal with this, some would say, well, just lower your vultures down and, and could solve this issue. That would solve it for one year. But because the funding is based on previous year's expenditures and utilization of vouchers, when I bring that utilization down, it brings my funding further down. And so I get into this spiral effect. If I do that to, to manage this year's budget, it impacts my next year's budget and my next year's budget. So if I back up then to here's the funding area that, that we serve in the yellow there um, and the entire metro there, uh, one of the issues with funding this with the general purpose levy that we had discussion with in the council and we kind of wrestled with but didn't really resolve for this year, but we need to resolve as we go forward. When I use the general purpose levy, that's levied across the entire metro, um, but my service area is, is smaller, so you have the entire metro that's paying for a smaller service area. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's, it's something that we need to wrestle with and does, say, does that make sense overall? for the future. And again, um, the way to fix this is to have uh, additional funding brought in, right? Um, or to 
manage your program now, but again, then you get into that spiral. So, so this is definitely um, on the plate for the community development committee to have more policy discussion around, but it's also something we'll be talking about in the management committee because it impacts the council's budget as a whole. So I just wanted to introduce you to, to that challenge that we are facing there with our HRA. Um, so wastewater charges, um, our municipal wastewater charge was a 3.5% increase in our 2019 budget. It's about a $5 increase per residential connection. Um, it's also about 41% lower than the national average. Um, so we are um, in really good shape as it relates to our wastewater. Um, the average metro household will pay $26 per month. About 55% of that comes to the Met Council, about 45% goes to the local municipality. Um, they get a lot for that now. Uh, our regional treatment plants um, receive platinum awards for discharge. Um, and two of the plants have 25 years of compliance. So uh, we maintain a really great system. And in terms of our peers across the nation, it's really great. And yet we have charges that are that are 41% lower than our peers. And so um, this is a good news story for, for the council and for the metro area. Um, our sewer avail access charge, we've had no change in that. It's, we've been ahead of flat rate since 2014. This is very much um, impacted by the economy and housing development. And, and um, it's another area where we have a reserve that um, used to manage those economic changes that occur. Use our SEC to pay for future development and for debt service. And then our industrial strength charges and our permit fees also had a about inflationary price increase. On the transit side, our fare revenue is 115 million in this budget. We had a last fare increase in October of 2017. It was 25 cents across the board. It had been eight years or more before we had a, a um, fair increase. Um, part of that was Governor Dayton's administration and, and um, doing some kind of one-time funding through state appropriations, um, just not having an appetite for that or the previous council having an appetite for that. Uh, we really need to, to kind of maintain our cost recovery, have an every four year um, conversation about whether this rate increase needs to happen. As we put together our plans for Southwest Light Rail, we reflect that every four year increase um, in the fares. Uh, and again, that helps us keep our ratio of fare revenue to cost um, kind of in line with what we expected and what would be a best practice for, for a transit organization. So you can expect kind of in that 2021 timeframe that we'll be looking to the council for a fair increase. Motor vehicle sales tax. This is our other very large challenge in our budget. Um, we, I'm gonna kind of switch over to a state fiscal year hat because for transportation in particular, we wear our, count, our calendar year hat because that's how we adopt our budget, but we also have to wear a state fiscal year hat because a lot of our funding comes from the state. We are particularly interested in the motor vehicle sales tax because it funds such a large portion in particular of our bus system. Um, so this slide shows the state fiscal year, the February 2017 forecast. That's on the top. It had an average growth of 5% in that forecast. And then the November forecast for 2017 came out. And we had significant concern. As you can see from the red line at the bottom in the shaded area I have there, um, we saw a drop of $111 million in our funding that we could expect over those four years. And not only did we see a drop in that revenue, but you can see that the, the trend, the growth trend, dropped from a 5% growth trend, trend to a 2.3% growth trend. When we adopt our budget and when we are building our budget, we base our preliminary budget on that February forecast. And then we adjust in November for the, no, for the November forecast when we adopt our final budget. So that kind of a change in, from forecast to forecast um, raised some significant concern for us. Um, we took measures right away because we know 
that we need to be a part of the solution when something like this happens. So we did a hiring freeze on all non-service staff, so not the bus drivers or the maintenance folks, but the administrative and folks um, that serve Metro Transit, not only Metro Transit, but regional administration as well, because we allocate costs to that division. So as well, we, we put a hiring freeze on as well. We made some administrative cuts. We have a regular process in transit where we looked at, look at all of our service routes and we harvest and then we reinvest those routes in other areas. We move to a harvest, but not reinvest. Um, so we were doing a number of things to help us position to be able to solve this problem into the future because we knew going into the legislative session um, that was going to be a, a major issue for us. So the February forecast came along and, and that improved um, significantly by about $30 million um, later in the year. It also, you know, you can see in the purple shaded area there, we've got some of that growth rate coming back for us. Um, still issues uh, with kind of that long-term forecast, but, um, but a little bit better. Um, we improved again in the 20, in the um, November of 18 forecast and the growth rate kind of up at a 3.4% right now. Um, and then here we are and with the latest forecast, the February forecast that just came out and I extended it out now to, to state fiscal year 2023. I was really surprised by this forecast to be quite honest with you. Um, I was expecting the opposite result again because everything I'm reading about car sales shows that the, the, the cars, that there's concern about car sales across the nation. So this forecast kind of surprised me. It's a good surprise. Um, growth of $59 million over in that shaded area there. Um, they brought down the growth rate a little bit. So if I look out 10 years in this forecast, that going from a 3.4% growth rate to a 3% growth rate is gonna cost us about $29 million. So over the long term, it, it came down, but it, it it's actually a forecast that's kind of bringing us back along that trend line or even a little bit above that trend line of 2017. Um, do I trust this forecast? I'll be the first to tell you that I don't. We've seen just the volatility <coughs> over just a couple of forecasts that I showed you there. Um, if I were to look back to 2002 and show you the forecast for 2002, I'd see these lines in the forecast that go up like this over and over and over, and I'd see the actuals coming down here. And so do I trust it? Um, probably not. That's why we budget 95% of the forecast and then actual receipts from the prior year that come in over 95%, which last year they did. So that's good too. Um, but this is what we have to work with as we go into the legislative session because the forecast is the truth until it's not the truth anymore and the mm -hmm. actuals in or we get the next forecast. So that brings us to an important slide here. Um, this slide shows our structural position for transportation as we go into the legislative session here. So our structural position means that our expenses are greater than our revenues that are coming in. Um, for 2019 and 2018, the legislature fixed that structural deficit by giving us a one-time appropriation. So in 2019, the $40 million you see there is a non-base appropriation that the legislature gave us to solve the problem in the past, but they didn't solve the problem going out into the future. And so we still have a structural balance issue for transportation. Um, the green that you see there are reserves that we have in transportation that are above our target reserves. Remember I said that we have a target fund balance for all our operating funds. And when we saw this problem, we started taking measures to create savings to be a part of the solution for that. And then our rosier MVES picture solved part of the problem as well. So the reserves above target are what we use, are using to better our financial position. So better financial position, and in 2019, we solved our, the, the issue in our financial position, but it didn't solve our structural balance issue. This is why the governor's proposal 
looks the way the governor's proposal looks because we're looking to actually solve the structural problem rather than band-aiding it with a one-time fix that's been done year after year after year. So the reserves above target there is 77 million. If you add that across, 52 million of that is in plus. 10 million in rail and 15 million in Metromobile. And this next slide shows where the problem is. Um, because bus had those savings that we applied, we don't have a problem in bus across the next biennium. Our problems are in metro mobility and rail operations. And, and really, metro mobility is the story here. That's mandated service. Um, we rely on state appropriations to fund that. Remember, I said MVS primarily funds our bus system. State appropriation funds metro mobility. When the legislature doesn't fund metro mobility with general, with general fund, that means we have to potentially dip into motor vehicle sales tax to, because it's mandated service. So that means the regular bus system has to pay for that, that service. And so um, that's the basis that's in the uh, governor's budget. And this is the governor's budget for investing in, in one Minnesota and investing in transit. And I'm just going to hand out his larger version of that that's right off of the governor's um, website. So the governor is proposing dedicated funding for metro mobility. So taking it out of the, the total transit picture so that, it, that it's not taking away from, from regular route bus anymore and giving it its own dedicated budget line. Uh, for metro mobility and, and a request of 36.5 million for state fiscal year 2021. He's also proposing an eighth cent sales tax <laughs> in the seven county metropolitan area to, and that really closes that structural issue that we have. But right now, again, we're solving that with, with reserves. So our financial position is okay, but it does not solve the structural um, position. So eight cent sales tax in the seven county metro area, and then an increase in the motor vehicle sales tax from 6.5% to, to max the sales tax at 6.875%. We get 36% of the, the um, motor vehicle sales tax. Again, it's a very volatile revenue source, but um, increasing it helps us as well. A portion of that then goes to the suburban transit providers as well. So of our 36, they get a portion of that. The governor is also proposing general obligation bonding of $20 million in his budget and hoping to see that year after year. Um, with that $20 million, that's our, our ABRT, the state share of our, our um, uh, bus rapid transit in particular for this year, that's the D-line. But over the next 10 years, we anticipate that we could build 10 more ABRT lines. And so um, if you read through his, his um, budget there, you'll see those things that that, um, that funding will do for us. And so this is a very important um, proposal and put forth by the governor. It's something that we haven't seen um, because we haven't had a very friendly uh, legislature in the past. It's something that's kind of unprecedented for us. Um, and uh, we're looking, hoping to see this move forward. So I've kind of hit that natural breaking point. I'm done kind of overviewing the operating. Uh, we can stop here and pick up the capital program at a different time. Chair? I mean, that's kind of the thought is, is it's five o'clock and I think that this has been a lot, right, for today. I mean, one thing I want to say is the budget for One Minnesota is really what I and the cabinet members have been working on um, since we came here. You all have worked on it before we came, but then we came and had many, many meetings on this with uh, Minnesota management and budget and then the governor and the lieutenant governor. And so this is something I spend a lot of my time talking about and trying to, to go out. Some of you have heard my, my talk about this, but we just met with, um, as I mentioned, we met with... Uh, Chair Hall, and uh, he really is interested in the metro mobility. He brought that up, that he's very positive about that. So that's a really great sign, right? Because that would help solve that structural deficit. Um, so I think if we could take a couple of questions and then probably take a break, I think would be a good idea and we could take up capital another day. I, are there any questions on the budget? I know it's a lot to, and you will, if it's like it is at the city, right, you, we will learn this as we go along because we do this, we'll do this every single year over and over and over. Council Member Lee. Yeah, um, I, I don't know a lot about HRA and 
the uh, housing voucher. So this might be an ignorant question, but is the issue with this pickle, is it like, do we have, how much teeth do we have asking different cities and counties to take more vouchers or what are the incentives and issues with this pickle exactly? How can we learn more and be part of the strategies? I'm Chair. Yes, Council member. Um, that is one of the discussions that we need to have. Uh, one of the ideas was we should go to those other counties, um, cities, areas, and, and look to potentially have them help us with this problem. So that's, again, one of the, one of the kind of, it's a, it's a policy discussion as well as a willingness. Um, we don't have a lot of leverage, I will say, um, but um, it, that is one of the options that, that we would be looking at in terms of how do we solve that problem. Okay. Other questions? Council Member Fredson. Thank you, Chair. Hopefully these, uh, I have two questions. Hopefully they make sense. Um, for the first one, um, so we, we rely on the implicit, implicit price deflator. Is there a reason why we don't use consumer price index or is that dictated by the state legislature? Madam Ms. Chair, um, yes, that's in statute. Okay. Uh, and then the second question I had was, if I heard you right, you said that the council has historically not, um, uh, has, has come in under the max levy that they set, right? And so I guess the question I would have is, does that generally mean that the council has felt that priorities outside of those that uh, rely on the legislature for funding are being adequately funded? Or I guess, could you speak to that? I'm Chair. Ms. Bogey. Uh, council members. So, um, yes, we are underneath our, our maximum limit, but only because uh, we have no need to, to levy for the highway right of way program. So, that's a program where we buy up land along future highways. Um, and then, as it's kind of a revolving loan fund. And so, as then those highways are built and MnDOT pays for the, the, the land that it takes there, it replenishes. Um, we have about 16 million, I think, in, the, in that fund, and so there really isn't a need to levy for that because we have plenty of cash in that fund for the next person that comes to say, hey, we want to sell this land for a future trunk highway is going to be. So because we don't have to levy that one and because Parks isn't putting any pressure on that levy right now, then we're below the cap. Uh, we are levying to the max for our livable communities, and we're levying, levying to the max for our general purpose levy. Yeah. So the only reason that we're under and have been able to manage under um, in recent years is because we're not living for the highway right away. Thank you. Councilmember President, anything else? Is there any other questions? Uh, Councilmember Lilly. Yeah, you thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Ms. Bogey, for the presentation. This is really helpful. I just have a question about the structural and financial position slide. It was slide 26, and then the reserves, reserves above target. And I'm just wondering why there's the relative stability in the out years, or 2021 to 2023, but the steep increase uh, between 2019 and 2020. And I'm just trying to better sort of understand the dynamics and pressures on, on the budget. I'm sure I'm not sure I understand the question. Can you? Sure. So in the reserves above target, there's a steep increase between 2019 and 2020. And then in the out years, beyond that, there's relative stability. And I'm just wondering why. Okay. And just remember, just a reminder, and we're just getting used to this. So if you have a follow-up, just remember just to go through the chair. Sure. And, yeah. uh, and so forth. So, Ms. Madam Bowie. Chair and Council Member. Yeah. So the, the application of the reserves in this table is directly related to what the funding issue is and who has the reserves and who has the, the okay. full. So as I apply reserves, I'd have to look in concert with this one. Okay. So BUS had significant reserves, $52 million above target. Um, rail operations and Metro Mobility didn't have the reserves, but they're where the problem is. Okay. okay? So that's why the reserves aren't equal because I'm, I'm setting the aside. Now, could I use reserves for a bus to solve a metro mobility problem? Um, yes, we'd have to come to the council and do a budget amendment to move them, but, but we could. Is that the right um, policy for us to have? Probably not. We need the legislature to solve the problem that metro mobility is causing us. Thank you, Thank you Madam Chair. Anything else, Council Member? Thank you, Madam Chair. Anybody else? Anything else? It's, uh, you know, I will just say, you know, budgets, right, it's a lot to absorb. And I, I tell you, some of the 
some of the jars look kind of similar and you know so that we get to learn and learn how to sort it out but with time i know it will happen and uh, mary's also available for questions but just know that we'll be going through this what month I'm, every single month it seems we'll probably have some kind of budget uh item especially as we get closer to setting our level <coughs> So with that, uh, I think we will move on to the next item. Uh, good presentation. Thank you very much for that. Uh, finally, on the agenda, there are um, reports. And so we'll try to move through these somewhat uh, quickly. So for the chair's report, I just want to let you know I visited with the Regional Council of Mayors on Monday. Um, and Councilmember Cummings and Lindstrom were there. Uh, they were both on the executive committee. So they have come off that and come off that group. Molly will still be kind of a liaison to that group, um, but it was an opportunity to talk about the governor's transit proposal. So it's really important that mayors hear about this. I, tomorrow, I'm going to, I'm part of the Itasca housing group. Itasca is forming um, a group to uh, meet six times to examine housing uh, in our area. Um, they're particularly interested in uh, what we call workforce housing, right? So police officers, teachers, uh, that type of thing. Uh, if, if you have any interest in that, let me know or have any questions. Um, and also, uh, it's great to have the new council members here and your questions. And I thought the swearing in was fantastic. You know, I don't think I've ever seen this room that full. And so um, really looking forward to that. So council members, any reports? Council member Barb. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you will all be getting an invitation um, in the next, either today or tomorrow, um, for Transit Driver Appreciation Day. Spoke about it earlier, but I also just want to remind everyone it's on Monday, um, and it will be um, there'll be events at all of our garages throughout the metro. Um, and I think I, I've found it over the years to be one of the best events to go attend, and you get to talk with the operators and get a feel for the garages, which I think is fantastic. Council Member Wolf and I last year went and served lunch um, to the crew at the South uh, South Garage, and so doing things like that I think is really important. So I would um, I hope that some of you can come join us on. Monday, and if you've got any questions, feel free to reach out. Excellent. So I'm, and I'm definitely looking forward to that. We're doing an East Metro uh, bus garage for any of you in the East Metro um, over sort of on the east side. Uh, any other reports? Okay. Council Member Sterner. Thank you, uh, Chair. I just was able to visit with Invergrove Heights uh, City Council on Monday, and they're going to have a new community development director. I look forward to having a meeting with the community development at a work session coming up. Excellent. Okay, anything else? All right, we will uh, see if there's anything from our regional administrator Parks. or our council. Okay, thank you. Uh, with that, I will take a motion to adjourn. So moved, the Chair. Second. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. A motion to adjourn. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? With that, we are adjourned.